I came here saying I was going to speak about the woman at the well. And while I was sat there, God just spoke to me and, and just changed it all up. And I don't know what he's going to do tonight, but I just know that he's speaking to somebody or some specific people in here tonight. And I don't even know what to entitle it because it's just so upside down. But I'm just going to go with it. Um, how desperate are you? That's the question he wants to ask. How desperate are you to break through that barrier? How desperate are you to break through that barrier? And the barrier is that metal, steel, brick, whatever that wall is, that is stopping you from reaching the climax for the law, that's stopping you from getting to your destination. How desperate are you to get your breakthrough? And I thought, just in hearing these testimonies tonight, you heard these girls say how desperate they were. You heard them say the level of, 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 of lowness got beyond themselves and they cried out. Some of them didn't even know who they were crying out to. They just cried out, help me. And God being God of action stepped into play. But they had to get, the key there is that they had to get to the beyond themselves. And sometimes we can't, even as Christians, we can be in a position that we detest, that we hate, but we stay there and we think and we allow people to tell us. You know, some of us go to all these secular counsellors and therapists that tell us that you have to live with these things. We have to live with anxiety. We have to live with mental illness. We have to live with, with eating disorders. We have to live with all these different things. But the God that told me says he comes to set the captive free. That's what he says. That's what God's word says. As my sister there said, this is a powerful book. It's God breathing. And he says it comes to set the captive free. So to me, that's, that's what happens. So there's so many people in the Bible that met with Jesus and their life changed. The, you hear about the paraplegia. I'm talking about the desperate measures that they went to for their freedom. The paraplegic guy, he had two of his friends come to this house where he knew Jesus was. And they went in and it was so crowded. Now, they could have just taken this man in his little bed or whatever it was and go home. But they said, no, we've got to get to this man. And they went desperate measures. They climbed up on the roof, took the roof off and lowered the man down for the man to get his healing. And then you hear of the, 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 the man at the tomb who ran out of the tomb when Jesus was passing by one day. Cried out to him. Cried out to him. This is a man that cut himself daily, that was chained up because he was out of his mind, the Bible tells us. Out of his mind. But that guy was desperate. Desperate. He came running to Jesus. He met with Jesus. And he was delivered. But there are two women that I want to spend a little time. I'm not going to take up a lot of time because I really believe that the people in here that this message is for know this message is for them. They've been living a life that they're sick and tired of. You know, they're coming to church Sunday after Sunday and there's nothing great happening in their life. Even some of my girls, you know, they're struggling with issues that no matter how many hours counselling, no matter how many times they get prayed for, no matter how many times they're talking to themselves, they just cannot shift this, this issue. But there was a woman called Anna in the Bible. Now, this woman, she was married to a guy called Kenny Kenaya. Something like that. <laughs> Let me tell you what his name was. Thank you. Ekle, there, something, Eklenaya or something. He was married and, and he had another wife called Penina. Now, Ekle, let's call him Mr. E for now. Mr. E, <laughs> Mr. E loved Hannah. He loved her and adored her, but she couldn't have any children. She was barren. But the other wife now, she was having children, pushing them out like rabbits. She was having loads of children, children after children after children. Now imagine you've got this husband, and this husband loves you, and he's telling you how much he loves you. He's telling you it doesn't matter that you can't have children. He loves you. But then this, this other wife, 
having all these children and taking them up to the temple yearly like they do and the blessings and everything. And that love that he had for her wasn't enough. She just wanted to have a child. Because this woman taunted her all the time and said, oh, you're barren, you're not blessed, and you're this and you're that. And no matter how much her husband expressed how he loved her, it wasn't enough. She got desperate. She got desperate. And she went to the temple this day. And it said that, the, it said in the Bible, let me just read what it says. It said, then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorstep of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Now this wasn't no, no. <laughs> it was bitterly, it came from the bottom of her belly. She made a, a vow and said, O oh Lord of your host, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maiden servant and remember me and not forget your maid servant, but will give your maid servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Now it came about that praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. Now, this woman wasn't saying it out. She was saying it in her spirit, but the desperateness must, be, must have been showing on her face. Eli thought she was drunk. Eli thought she was drunk because all he could see was this. He thought she was drunk, but she was praying in desperate. And you know something? She had to pray like that because not long after, she had a child. She had a child. And she honoured her word with that child and gave him back. But then God blessed her with more children. But before she could break that, she had to be desperate. She had to, she had to push past her insecurities. But there's another woman that I want to talk about. And I'm going to ask for some, some props. I'm going to talk about the woman with the issue of blood. And I want about six, seven volunteers. Quickly, come on. I said six, can we not count? <laughs> and can I borrow your, that scarf that you've got, um, Kelly? Now, who wants to be Jesus? Jesus. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Lauren, can you be Jesus, please? You just stand there. You just be hovering around Jesus. Hover around Jesus. He's talking to Jesus. You want Jesus' attention. You want Jesus' attention. A couple more volunteers. Or a couple more people here, please. Come on, quickly. A couple more people here. <laughs> now, this is a woman that the Bible tells us had an issue. She had a situation in life for 12 years. 12 years this woman had an ailment that the Bible tells us that she went to many, many physicians. And instead of getting better, look about Jesus, don't look at me. Instead of getting better, it got worse. Now this woman had come to the end of herself. And I imagine, I imagine back in those days, blood was seen as a curse, it was seen as that you were in sin, it was just seen as a bad thing. And I imagine this woman would have been ostracized and she'd have been sent to the end of the town. She wouldn't have been able to mix with people. But while out there, she'd have been with the lepers and the people that were sent away. Now, I imagine that she would have heard the stirring town that Jesus, there's a man in town that's healing people, that is changing lives. And she would have thought to herself, I wonder if this man can do anything for me. I wonder if he can heal my issue. Now, for that woman to go into town, everybody knew that she was kicked out of town. Everybody knew. 
They knew the problem. They knew she was unclean. Now that woman would have thought, how am I going to get to see this man? Now I believe she would have done it like this. And she'd have been there. She'd have had to go low because she didn't want to be seen. And she'd have been thinking, if I can just, if I can just, just reach him. There's so many people there. And if they see me, they'll kill me. I can't let anybody see me. There's so many people. But if I just stay low, I might just be able to get his attention. They're looking at me. If I can just reach. If I can just reach, how am I going to get to him? I'm desperate. 12 years. I've had this problem and I've tried everything to get a release and nothing's happened. I've no more money. I've had to leave my husband and my children. And I just need to just get one touch. I believe if I can just touch, if I can just touch the hem of his garments. <sighs> oh. Oh my gosh. And she touched the hem of his garment and she was made whole. She was made whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She was made whole. But that woman, she had to be desperate and she had to risk her life. If you get to really comprehend what went on in those days, to be bleeding was a bad sign. It was a bad thing. So she had to risk something to get her release, to get her healing. And that's why I ask you again, how desperate are you? You know, I believe there's some people here living with some wayward husbands that they're not happy with, that are unsaved. We have children, grandchildren even, that are in addiction are alcoholics we're suffering with anxiety fear and some of us just said well, that's, that's my lot in life but I believe that God is saying tonight that it's not that it's not but you have to get desperate you have to get desperate it's a matter of life and death you heard my sister there say, choose today. Blessings or cursings. It's life or death. And it has to be a life or death situation. You know, I give God thanks to my mom. Because I'm an only child. I'm 54 years old. And I'm an only, I was not, well, I'm still an only child. I have no brothers and sisters. But from the age of, I grew up in a, an amazing Christian home. My parents, both Christians godly people, but from a very early age, I was rebellious and rebelled for having to go to church. But you see, my mom, from my first prison sentence, I've done three prison sentences, adding up to about nine and a half years altogether. But my first prison sentence, my mom started calling on God and said, God, you've got to change my daughter. You've got to bring my daughter back to me. Nothing happened. I went on to do another two-month sentence, but my mom never... You know, sometimes people ask us, oh, how's young Tommy doing? Or how's young Sarah or whoever you're doing? And you say, oh, they're fine, they're fine. When you know they're not, you know they're not doing good at all. And instead of saying, oh, they're not doing so good, will you pray for them? Because you feel embarrassed or shame, you say they're fine. Well, my mum wasn't one of their mothers. My mum was the mother who would say, she's in prison, pray for her. She's leading this life, she's selling drugs, pray for her. But I tell you, you see those prayers. My mom declared one day that she was not going to heaven without her one child. She declared it, that she was not going to heaven without her daughter, her one daughter. And although it never happened, it took a long while for it to happen. You know, I've been walking clean and free and, and in an amazing, intimate, wonderful relationship with God for around 12 years now. But it took all that time for her prayers to be answered. 
And now we have an amazing relationship where we can glorify God together. But before that, I was in drug addiction for 17 years. I would live the gangster lifestyle, in and out of prison. But my mom never stopped praying. She got desperate. And you have to get desperate today. And I know I'm speaking to somebody. I know I'm speaking to somebody because God wouldn't have, you know, I spent all week preparing that lovely sermon about the woman at the well. And then I came in here and sat there for about 15 minutes and he just twisted it up. So I know that he's speaking to someone in here today. You've got an issue or issues in your life that you just think, God's not listening. God's not going to come through for me. It's not working. But I've come to tell you today that God has heard and he knows. But you've got to get desperate. You've got to stop taking it as part of your life. You know why I'm always correcting people when I hear them say, oh, when I say, how are you? They say, well, it's my anxiety or my this and my that. You don't have my heart problem or my, it doesn't belong to you. You know, and when we're claiming these things as part of us, you know, we're bringing so much on ourselves. You know, them things do not come from God. They come from the enemy. You know, and I want us tonight to really consider how desperate do we want our breakthrough. It might be personal issues. Things that you just can't, you know, you've, you, you're not joy, you've got no joy, you're not waking up with a joy. Say to yourself, to yourself, why? When I serve an amazing God, why am I not waking up with a joy? Why am I, you know, my family not coming to the Lord? Why am I not shining enough? Why am I not enough? And get desperate. That woman with the issue of blood could have died. The paraplegic men, they could have gone away and come back the next day. But they said no. And they went to extreme. That guy could have fallen out of that bed. Anything could have happened. But they wasn't bothered. All they knew is that that man had to meet with Jesus. They could have killed that crazy man before he got to Jesus, thinking he was going to attack Jesus. But they didn't. And he got his breakthrough. And I could go on and on and on and on, telling you different stories about people that took desperate measures. Even these girls... Walking, they were on the lowest, but they still had to make that choice to give up their freedom. Even though it wasn't a freedom, really, but to give it up, to come to a place for 10 months under a strict regime, they had to make that choice. But they were desperate. And what did God reward their desperateness with? Freedom. You heard the testimonies. Nicola was living in fear. Hannah was living in fear. Linda, all living in fear, turmoil, desperate. Then he's talking about the seed with all these flaws. But when she cried out and God filled her with his spirit, she started to bear good fruits. And that's what it's like when you get desperate. I cried out to God 12 years ago. And the, the life that God has given me the last 12 years. And it, ain't, it isn't over yet. Last year, or this year, he provided me with a lovely husband at 54. Woohoo! You know, at 54 years old, he provided me with an awesome man of God. You know, so all you single ladies, single ladies, <laughs> don't give up. Don't give up. It's never too late for a shower of rain, my mother used to say. So I just want to encourage you tonight, really seriously. I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you. Get desperate. Get serious with these issues. Don't receive them. Don't keep them. Don't harbor them. Don't nurse them. Declare war and say, I am going to get my freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know who I'm handing over to. I know it's time for ministry. There's always time for ministry at Trinity. That rhymes, doesn't it? Always time for ministry at Trinity. Awesome church. I'm going to hand over to Ken, is it? Well, Beverly, since God changed that word, I think he's given you authority mm -hmm. to minister to those who are responding to that message. Okay. And right. any other part of uh, mm -hmm. their needs, yep. Steve and myself and John, mm -hmm will be open 
the minister and pray for you. Mm -hmm. Just encourage you to remember that God is at work. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's respect the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. If you want to talk and you want to have fellowship, mm -hmm. go outside. Mm -hmm. But God is changing lives. Yeah. So let's just continue worshiping yeah. God. And I, I personally would specifically like to pray for those who have loved ones that are in addiction, that are stuck in addiction, that you've been praying for. It could be grandchildren, it could be a neighbor, it could be anything because, you know, statistics say that everybody, almost everybody knows somebody now that's in addiction, whether it be alcoholics. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of sly alcoholics nowadays that drink a bottle of wine a night and say they're not an alcoholic. You are an alcoholic if you have to drink a bottle of wine a night. So I want to pray for anybody that's got loved ones, people dear to them that are in addiction, that they really want a breakthrough for them, or anybody that suffers with anxiety and fear. Amen. Thank you. So shall we have the worship group up?